What is going on, everyone? Welcome into the reveal of the number three team in my 2023 NFL Power Rankings, as today we're going to take a deep dive into the Philadelphia Eagles, the defending NFC champions, maintain their crown, at least heading into the year, ranking as the top dog in the NFC, but a team that did have a lot of roster movement and staff turnover over the course of this offseason gonna open up some question marks that i'm looking forward to talking about here in this video we're gonna get right into it but first before we get started if you could take just a second to hit that like button down below we got just three more of these to go let's finish strong i appreciate you guys it really does help also make sure you subscribe we do have that nfl content coming just around the corner with the season starting i do want to say I'm going to have a scheduled live show every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern with Matthew Caller right here on the channel. So make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you guys are ready for that. It's going to be a ton of fun. But let's get into it, as always, starting with the team's offseason. As I mentioned, it was a busy one for the Eagles. And just as any team that is such a top dog as the Eagles were and have the roster talent and staff talent that a team like the Eagles had, you're going to lose some pieces. And I think Howie Roseman did about as good of a job as any GM in the league could have in terms of weathering the storm and still having a good offseason relative to what he had to work with. But uh, that's not to say there weren't losses here and that this is necessarily uh, it, it, that this is simply last year's team, if you know what I'm saying. So that is going to start with the coaching staff. We're going to go through every position group here and talk about w which was upgraded which was downgraded, which is staying the same. And I, I do have the coaching in Philadelphia is downgraded heading into next year. I don't, I don't know how you could say otherwise. Specifically, though, with the offense, I mean, look, Shane Steichen was really good here. And he gets the head coach job in Indianapolis. You can make an argument that the Eagles offense didn't really show its wings, pun intended, uh, until uh, Nick Sirianni, the head coach, handed the keys to the offense to Shane Steichen. So they're going to have in-house Brian Johnson stepping in. And that's just going to be wait and see in terms of is he going to be as good as Shane Steichen was. And we'll talk more about Johnson and Sirianni in just a minute. Um, but also a major shakeup with the defensive coaching staff. Definitely going to open up some question marks. Now, Eagles fans, I think for the most part, are just fine with Jonathan Gannon leaving. Many view straight up going from Gannon to Desai as addition by subtraction or just an upgrade, if you will. And honestly, I don't entirely disagree with that. Uh, but... I do think you also have to remember that Vic Fangio was in this building really helping Jonathan Gannon kind of by overseeing his own scheme. Both Gannon and Desai coming in here are kind of that Fangio disciple type of coach where they want to run a lot of quarters and off zone matching coverages. And without Fangio there, I think that is the real downgrade with the defensive coaching. So, yeah, I mean, pretty self-explanatory. The coaching is downgraded on paper, and they're going to have to prove that they can be as good as they were last year, uh, again, this year. Now, in terms of the rest of the roster, offensively, really not a ton of concerns. Uh, the one downgrade I have for them is going to be the offensive line, where they do lose their starting right guard, Isaac Sayamalu, and backup interior slash tackle flex piece Andre Dillard who got a 30 million dollar contract from the Titans didn't have to play last year because they had incredible health on the offensive line but that's rare depth that they had last year that they won't this year and all they really were able to do to replace those two losses was Tyler Steen a third round pick out of Alabama who's going to convert from tackle to guard it truly is crazy that Isaac Sayamalu was their worst offensive lineman last year, and he was arguably a Pro Bowl caliber player. So even if he was their weakest link, he's still a damn good offensive lineman that's going to open up some questions at right guard. But across the rest of the offense, just kind of minor tweaks and tuning. They're going to swap backup quarterbacks, letting Gardner Minshew go to the Colts, and Marcus Mariota is going to come in from Atlanta. They spent a sixth-round pick on Tanner McKee. 
At running back, some might argue this is a downgrade. Look, Miles Sanders had as easy of a job as any running back in the league last year with the run blocking and the scheme set up in front of him. Am I really going to sit here and say that a combination of DeAndre Swift, Rashad Penny, and Kenneth Gainwell is a downgrade in the running back room from Miles Sanders? No, I'm I'm not. I'm going to call that neutral tight end they didn't lose anybody they did make a small trade for the physically gifted albert O. but i'm leaving that as neutral he's not projected to play a ton at least for now wide receiver i do actually have as very slightly upgraded they do lose their best blocking receiver and one of the best blocking receivers in the nfl in zach pascal Um, but an interesting addition to get a little bit more of a slot type in there with olemity zacchaeus i think is going to be a nice little uh, bump in this offensive uh, passing game so Outside of the right guard spot, a very good streamlined offense, uh, uh, offseason for the offense. But defensively, there are some real questions here, you guys. Uh, you know, you start with the interior defensive line. How can you go anywhere other than downgraded? I know there's a ton of excitement for Jalen Carter and for Jordan Davis, the two first round Georgia D tackles to step up. But we haven't seen them play at that high level. And they are saying goodbye. To Javon Hargrave, who's one of the five best pass rushing defensive tackles in all of football, just got a superstar contract for the Niners. We just raved about him in that Niners deep dive, and there's no guarantee that they replace the production they got from him. They also say goodbye to some veteran pieces that, while they weren't their former selves, did come in late last season and give them some critical snaps in Indomitian Sue, Linval Joseph. They're going to be relying on some more of that young depth to step up into those key uh, rotational defensive tackle roles. So the interior D-line is downgraded until proven otherwise. They did add Contavious Street, a pass rushing specialist, and Moro Ojamo in the seventh round. But they did upgrade on the edge. They somehow didn't lose anybody. They already had a great edge room. Um, But Nolan Smith gets brought in in the first round. So pretty clear upgrade there. But then linebacker, again, you can't go anywhere other than downgraded here. Yeah, they have N'Kobe Dean in place, but we have not seen him play. And just more unproven Georgia talent that they're hoping can step up to supplement the losses of the very talented TJ Edwards, who heads to Chicago, Kaiser White, who did maintain that starting job over N'Kobe Dean last year. They do bring in Zach Cunningham to kind of replace TJ Edwards as more of their thumping linebacker, Um, but he does have injury concerns throughout the course of his career. So downgraded at linebacker. Cornerback, this was one of the best things they were able to do this offseason was to find out how to retain both Darius Slay and Bradbury, who had great years last year. They don't lose them. And they add Keely Ringo to the mix, a a really speedy, big fourth-round corner out of Georgia. (laughs) Um, But uh, staying neutral there, not expecting to see Ringo much this year. Um, Then at safety, also going to be downgraded. Marcus Epps leaves in free agency, played 98% of their snaps last year. Also, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson had a big year as a safety for them. Their answers there are going to be undrafted year two player Reed Blankenship, Terrell Edmonds. So they bring in Cross State from uh, Pittsburgh and Sidney Brown, a third round safety. But that does not make up for those losses. Going to have to list that as a downgrade in the safety room. And then uh, they currently don't have a punter. I'm sure they'll get that figured out by the time the season starts. But uh, Aaron Sippos is not a great one. So I'm sure they'll at least stay neutral there, if not upgrade. But yeah, that's five starters on the defense, leaving in free agency. Anytime you lose half your starting lineup, you're going to open up some questions on if that group can be the same. And they feel like they have the pieces in place to supplement those losses. That's what we're going to be talking about throughout this video is if they do have the talent in place to replace those big losses. But they are there. But before we get into the roster, I want to talk about this coaching staff, which enters an interesting season with Nick Sirianni still on top of the show here uh, after losing both coordinators here. And I like Nick Sirianni. I think he has the trust of that locker room. And from a team culture and leadership perspective, the Eagles are in a good place under Nick Sirianni. That's really not my question on him. I have them ranked in that tier two for team culture, which ranks anywhere from seventh to 14th. But I do think you can raise questions about his impact on the offense as a supposed kind of young offensive guru 
uh, archetype of coach. You know, for the first kind of half season of his time here in Philadelphia, he was more in control of the offense and things really were not going well. So halfway through the year, he hands over play calling to Shane Steichen and the offense really took off. And Steichen now gets the, uh, the head coaching job for Indianapolis. This is a guy that really, you know, had... Justin Herbert in that 2020 season where he really burst onto the scene. Steichen had a lot of experience before that. He's a really good offensive coach. And I think you can beg the question, just how much offensive prowess does Nick Sirianni have to the table, uh, bring to the table? And you can absolutely beg the question of how good of an offensive coordinator is Brian Johnson going to be? Not that there's any negative knocks for Brian Johnson, but he's just entirely unproven. Now, Johnson's been here under Shane Steichen. He has some college roots as well. And the Eagles under Shane Steichen, and as we expect heading into next season, run about as much of a college spread offense as you'll see out there. A ton of shotgun, RPOs, QB running. And I know that the playbook is going to be the same for the most part with Brian Johnson, but how well is Brian Johnson at the timing of the offense, knowing when to pull what strings, when to go to easy buttons, when to call shot plays, you name it. And that's where Shane Steichen really had all the answers last year. And just from an overall game planning perspective as well, the Eagles are a rare offense where they can basically beat you however you ask them to beat you you know if you want to force them to beat you through the air they can do that if you want to force them to beat you through the ground they can do that but game planning for knowing how your opponent's gonna gonna attack you and all that stuff all of the duties for offensive coordinator outside of play design are up in the air for brian johnson now i'm gonna give them some benefit of the doubt here i still have them ranked in tier three for both pass game coaching and run game coaching very much right in the middle of the league. So it's not necessarily a concern, but it is a question, if that makes sense. I do think Shane Steichen is a very talented offensive mind, and they're going to have to find a way to replace that because the play calling here last year really was sensational. So very wait and see there. And then defensively as well, I'm less worried about it. I didn't think they were remarkably well coached defensively. In fact, Had they just kept Jonathan Gannon, they probably would have stayed in Tier 3 for defensive coaching as well, where I have them currently under Sean Desai. And Sean Desai is a good defensive mind. I think we've been kind of waiting for a couple years for him to prove that he's a great defensive mind. He's one of these Vic Fangio disciples, and we've seen a lot of these guys start to kind of get phased out of the league rather quickly. I think a lot of offenses are catching up a little bit to the Fangio scheme, understanding that you can run the ball against these six-man fronts that are playing a ton of quarters to high structures where those safeties aren't as available in run support, understanding that you can attack those types of coverages quite easily in the underneath passing game. So... We are seeing that a lot of these Fangio-style kind of disciples have had to pivot and play more man coverage, blitz more, play more aggressively. And did I think Sean Desai did a great job of making those adjustments in Seattle last year? No, not necessarily, but he also didn't have a ton to work with in Seattle. I'm kind of, at this point, one foot in, one foot out on Sean Desai. But it's very much a similar conversation where the playbook's going to be the same. It's just, you know, how does the button pushing go in terms of knowing when to heat things up with a blitz or change up your coverages or game plan for specific offenses. It's not that this was a bad hire. It's not that this was a great hire. It was just kind of a solid, nice hire to sort of maintain the status quo with what was a really good defense last year. So I would say overall, this is a good coaching staff. But I'm not going to rave about this group necessarily in the way that I did with, you know, the Niners or that I will with the Chiefs necessarily. But who knows? Maybe Brian Johnson turns into the next Shane Steichen and we get to rave about him midseason. TBD, I suppose. But before we get into the roster breakdown here, I got to tell you guys about the sponsor for today's video, Underdog Fantasy. The season is just around the corner. 
which means their pick em contests are about to hit full force with the NFL regular season starting. I'm sure you guys have seen the screenshots of people sharing their underdog slips where you string together anywhere from two to five players where you're selecting player stats, anything from fantasy points, passing yards, rushing touchdowns, you name it. You pick higher or lower based on the numbers that underdog sets. And you can win up to 20 times your money if you go five for five there. It's not just big payouts, though. This is the best way to increase your interest in any given, you know, crappy Thursday night football game or you want the full Sunday football slate. You can get that, too. Uh, I'll be playing underdog every single day that there is football going on this season. Uh, I can guarantee you that. So you guys are going to love underdog. And right now, if you sign up at underdog using promo code TFG, not only will you support my channel and this series, but they will match up to $100 on that first deposit. That is easily a, a full season's worth of extra pick them lineups there. So that is promo code TFG at underdog fantasy and good luck. Let's get back into it. But now it's time to get into this really fun roster. We're going to rank each position group, how they stack up against the rest of the league. And that means we're going to start with the quarterback room with Jalen Hurts. And before we even talk about Hurts, I want to ask Eagles fans to consider a little context here, because in this series, we're able to separate the quarterback's impact on the passing game with this grade here and his impact in the run game via that QB run game multiplier that we'll see in the run game segment coming up in just a second here. And typically, we as a football people kind of bake those two things together when we give those sort of overall ranks for quarterbacks there. So, you know, just consider some extra context here for this conversation right here. But even with that said, Jalen Hurts still comes in as my seventh ranked quarterback in the NFL as a passing threat. And while Eagles fans are going to want to see that ranking come in a little bit higher, this really is a true testament to Jalen Hurts' growth and development as a player. Like going back to when he was at Alabama, the thought of him someday being the seventh best passer in the NFL is unthinkable. And the growth he had from really from Alabama to the point where he got to the NFL to improve his throwing motion and his accuracy to the point where his accuracy is now some of the best in the league. That alone was impressive, but his growth since he got to the league has been crazy too. His ability to play in structure has improved every year. You've seen that time to throw come down, which is so important. Not taking as many bad sacks, letting the structure of the offense thrive to the point that we saw last year that was so efficient. But also his decision making to take better care of the football, that turnover worthy play percentage has come down each year. 4.6% his first year, 3.9% his second year all the way down to 1.8% last year, which was second in the NFL, making that a huge feather in his cap and asset to who he is as a passing threat. And we've also just seen kind of his pre and post snap processing get a little bit faster and better each year. The ability to make the right reads, read coverages, it's all improved his efficiency throughout the years. And if we see just another step up in that processing and decision making, because I, I would say it's 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 at it's like good, but it could be great with how it's continuing to climb. And that could really be a huge step towards him, in my mind, getting closer to kind of the Burrow, Josh Allen range of passing threats in the NFL. But I do want to say, like, I'm I'm not going to just totally glaze him up here. Like, there are still plays where he leaves meat on the bones and he doesn't let the plays fully develop, whether that's the deep dig or just bailing from clean pockets too early. That's been a knock on him that I've had throughout the years. Now, with everything else around that trait getting better, I'm less and less worried about it. But it is something that if you do want to say Jalen Hurts is an elite quarterback, uh, at least strictly as a passer, like, yeah, I'm going to be honest. Like, there are some plays where I'd rather see him hang in these clean pockets where he has the best pass protection in the NFL. And even just as a coaching note, this is super minor and not even really a knock, but I think it is something that could help him take that next step. When he's rolling out, which he does like to scramble and play extend quite a bit, I would love to see him just take a look back for any pursuing defenders. He kind of 
I don't want to say he rushes to the sideline, but he could use that space outside the pocket at an even more efficient level. And he has the athleticism too. If he looks back and sees it's a 280 pound end or something, you know, he can he can whip back inside in the ways that we see guys like Joe Burrow and Mahomes do to really have those crazy play extensions where he's, you know, converting third and longs in these miraculous ways. I think there's an opportunity for Hertz to do that a lot more. It's an instinctive thing. It's a difficult ask to say those things could come out, but it is a little bit something missing there that even a guy like Kyler Murray has sometimes Lamar Jackson as well. So, you know, again, that's not a criticism, but it's something I would just love to see. He really doesn't look for those pursuing defenders. He'll just kind of coast to the sideline. And if it's if he doesn't see anything, he'll just throw it out of bounds when he might be leaving some meat on the bones there. So, you know, we're getting into the point with Jalen Hurts where it's more minor criticisms, but I will say I'm done betting against him to get better. He's only proved that he will do that every single offseason. Until we don't see him be better than the year before, I'm done projecting him to kind of flame out or whatever, as I've done in years past. You know, my ranking of Jalen Hurts last year burned me. I had the Eagles 17th in my power rankings, and they went to the freaking Super Bowl. So... We're there with Jalen Hurts. He's freaking awesome. We'll, we'll talk more about what he brings to this team in the run game momentarily. Um, now, I do need to say that as we look like three years down the road, they just gave him that massive $50-plus million contract. I will say, if we don't see those improvements and he stays at this kind of stud level of passing threat and doesn't become an elite passing threat, there will come a time where he doesn't have the best offensive line in the NFL. These incredible receivers that all of that group stayed pretty much perfectly healthy last year. And he had a great play caller last year. Like, I'm not going to lie. Hurts him impressed himself, but he was playing NFL quarterback on rookie mode last year. It was like playing Madden with all the sliders turned down. And he definitely got the most out of this offense, but... What happens if you lose a right guard and that becomes a turnstile on your offensive line? What if you don't get 20 starts from A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith? Those guys get a lot of credit for what happened last year, too. So, I, you know, and it, it would have to be injuries this year that hurt his surrounding cast. Maybe the play calling uh, is significantly worse. But, you know, now that you are paying him that big money, over time, those cap hits will add up and it's going to become more difficult to have the best surrounding cast in the NFL. Howie's a genius, but he can only do so much. So deep down the road, we'll have to keep an eye on that. But barring injuries, it really shouldn't impact him too much this year. And hopefully that can help him develop to that elite level so that he's there by the time that the surrounding cast is worse, if that makes sense. But yeah, Jalen's awesome. Again, the Eagles rank seventh in the NFL at quarterback strictly from a passing perspective. Um, now, the backup room is different this year. They bring in Marcus Mariota. He can run this system. It's very similar to what he did at Oregon with the kind of college spread. So maybe he'd play better in this system than he did back in that kind of Shanahan-style offense where his accuracy was a huge issue in Atlanta. Decent enough signing. And then they draft Tanner McKee late in the draft. And uh, kind of, you know, why not? He doesn't have the mobility that a guy like Jalen Hurts does. But a really talented, younger quarterback in terms of experience. Definitely thought he was a value when they took him. And, you know, the Eagles are really good at getting something out of these, these backup quarterbacks over the last five years. And I think he could be in that sort of Nick Foles breath of, of really good backups someday. Uh, not immediately. Um, but let's talk about these weapons. There's very little to say. These guys were fully exposed last year. A lot of big-time games, a deep playoff run. And... Between A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith, these guys played 40 games last year. 40 games. That's pretty good luck with a guy in A.J. Brown who's missed time and Devontae Smith who's got a slender frame. I will say, if they suffered some injuries there, I'd be curious what this offense looks like because these guys really are the perfect freaking wide receiver duo. And what's crazy is I think you can only put a up arrow on Devonta Smith with how he finished the year strong last year. But let's start with A.J. Brown. I mean, like I said, there's just very little to say here, but you got to spend some time on him and rave about just how good he was. And they really built this offense through him. You know, on the early down passing game, his availability on those RPO slants 
really was a core part of the offense. And I'm curious to see how opposing defenses really try to uh, adjust to that this year. But it's difficult, man. Like, he is just so good at boxing out corners, winning that inside leverage. And he's 225 pounds with strong, firm hands. Some of the best kind of, I've always said, my ball, bitch, contested catch mentality. Strictly speaking on those slants, which are just a function of their run game, really. And then you use the threat of that to allow him to get open deep where he, to me, took a next step that he didn't necessarily have in Tennessee in terms of winning those balls on the perimeter, being that true deep threat. He had some of the most ridiculous deep ball catches in the NFL last year, and you wouldn't necessarily say that that about him in Tennessee. He was much more of a rack threat, an intermediate guy who caught crossing routes and dominated in that part of the field off of play action and all that stuff. And, oh, by the way, Philadelphia still tapped into his ability to do that, but it was the evolution deep and outside the numbers that, to me, elevated A.J. Brown into being an elite wide receiver in the NFL. And the fact that all they had to do was give up like the 18th pick or whatever it was to get him was just highway robbery and the salary cap, of course. But he's well worth paying. And then you have Devonta Smith, a top 11 pick himself. I think he was the 11th pick, quite possibly the best receiver in the history of college football he is one of the most unique, if not the most unique receivers in the NFL, because there's not a physically impressive thing about him. I would say his foot speed and acceleration is a plus trait that he has, but he's not the biggest receiver. He's not the fastest receiver, and he's really skinny. So in terms of like handling physical contact down the field, you'd expect him to, to really be disrupted by that stuff. And sometimes it does against really good, big physical corners, but that's a pretty specific matchup dependent thing. For the most part, he plays well above his size. His ability to win tough catches down the field just does not make sense. It defies the laws of physics. And he like, he has, like he's a guy, he would have like 99 Madden awareness. There's just this rare trait about him where he just gets it. Whether it's the ball tracking, the body control, situational awareness to know when to sit down in a zone. He is just a truly rare type of receiver. And he himself would be a ascending number one for most teams in the NFL. You know, if he had the opportunity a guy like C.D. Lamb has or maybe a Garrett Wilson. I think we'd view him very similarly to those types of players, but he doesn't even have to be that guy here because you already have A.J. Brown, so it's truly ridiculous that you have this duo, but it's even more ridiculous that it doesn't stop there. Let's talk about Dallas Goddard, who's their number three option in this passing game, and he's a top five tight end in the NFL. And Dallas Goddard's just, if you took Gronk and turned everything down, I don't know, 10%. But he's that kind of big, physical, classic Y tight end, a bit of a throwback in today's game. And just to begin with, he's a huge asset in the run game because he's one of the better run blocking tight ends in the NFL. And that helped contribute to one of the best rushing offenses in the NFL last year and here in Philadelphia. But he's a huge safety blanket for Jalen Hurts when he gets in a pinch. He loves finding Goddard on those corner routes or on a stick route underneath. Just give him a well-placed ball. And Hurts knows that Goddard's probably going to come down with that more often not than not. But even if he doesn't, he's going to break up the interception. He's got just enough athleticism to be a nice separator as a route runner to he's super physical and instinctive after the catch. He's He's awesome, man. And he himself would be one of the one or two best weapons on most teams in the league. But he gets to be almost an afterthought in this passing game. Um, and then they bring in Olemide Zacchaeus, who is listed as a starter over Quez Watkins. I, I do think it's going to be somewhat of a rotation, though Zacchaeus makes sense as a true slot wide receiver here. And he's been a nice player for the Falcons. He's undersized. He was not a highly invested draft capital kind of guy, but he's he's just a good player. He runs good routes. He's got solid hands, decent after the catch. He's a good prototype slot wide receiver. He's got some speed to kind of be a threat on slot fades and posts um, on any kind of shot play they want to run. He brings an element to this passing game that they actually didn't really have last year. I guess Greg Ward is Zacchaeus-esque, but Zacchaeus is just a more juiced up version of Greg Ward, who, by the way, I think is still in the practice squad here. We're not going to list uh, practice squatters 
at this point in the series. But yeah, I think he's just going to be kind of a headache for defensive coordinators. He's not going to have a huge season. He's not someone I want in fantasy football. It's going to be a lot of quiet weeks from him, but he's just another option here. Uh, and then Quez Watkins also makes sense. Talk about a diversity of complementary skill sets. Quez Watkins is a one-trick pony. He's a deep threat, a perimeter a speedster. But I think there are certain looks where they can put Brown or Devonta Smith into the slot, pull Zacchaeus off the field, and have more of a vertical presence in Quez Watkins. So just another option for this staff to you know piece together frustrating game plans, just as they did last year. You've also got the option of using these running backs more in the receiving game. They really didn't. I I think part of that is Jalen Hurts is more inclined to scramble than he is to take the check down. Um, but they also, you know, they have A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith that they use in the RPO game and the screen game. They don't really want to do that with their running backs all that much. Maybe that changes with more of a dynamic guy with the ball in his hands like DeAndre Swift or with Kenneth Gainwell seeing the field more often but theoretically both Gainwell and DeAndre Swift are plus pass catching backs even Boston Scott buried down there as RB4 is good at it so they've got even more options to do different stuff there in terms of the rest of the pieces here you know there's really not a whole lot of opportunities for targets to go around you will have Jack Stoll in there when they want to go 12 personnel. He's a, a very solid blocker. They like what he does there. Grant Calcaterra is kind of that undersized wing flex tight end. I'm sure they have some different packages for him to kind of get him loose off of play action and use his kind of speed and mismatch ability out of the tight end spot. Um, and then, you know, just why not? They bring in Albert O. I'm, you know, I, I love glazing up. Uh, Howie Roseman and talking about how great he is. I do think he's the best GM in the NFL. I saw that trade and I was like, okay, I guess why not? But I'm not going to act like Albert O has been a great player in the NFL. Maybe something clicks here, but, you know, they swapped a sixth round pick for a seventh round pick to get a little bit more uh, athletic ability in the room there. Why not? He's made some plays. It's just been few and far between. But that rounds out your group of weapons. They rank fourth in the NFL you could make an argument that they should be number one, honestly. I'd understand it. Um, there's some insane groups of weaponry in the NFL. We've talked about some of them already. We still haven't talked about the Bengals and what they have there. But I, I would just say the Eagles are in that first tier of weaponry in the NFL. Now, in terms of the run game, they build this thing around the offensive line and Jalen Hurts to the point that they actually rank 31st in running back. Now, even though they rank 31st, I'm not going to say it's a concern or a weakness. It's just everybody's got good running backs in the NFL. That's why they're not really getting paid, right? So I actually think there's a world where this combination of DeAndre Swift, Kenneth Gainwell, and Rashad Penny is a better running back room than what they had in Miles Sanders last year and with the run lanes these guys are going to have there's a lot of opportunities for production here now they're all very different stylistically what you don't want this to turn into is that uh, it's a tell in terms of what you're going to run based on which back is out there you don't want it to be where okay DeAndre Swift is in it's either a pass or an outside run Kenneth Gainwell's in, it's going to be a pass. Rashad Penny's in, it's going to be some kind of inside zone or something like that. So they're going to have to find the right balance here. But again, these guys all have talent in their own right. DeAndre Swift was a early second round pick for good reason. He's incredibly physically talented. He's still up there in terms of elusiveness in space and just speed and explosiveness at the running back position. But genuinely, some of the worst vision in the entire NFL. He has never seen an inside run that he doesn't want to bounce outside. He has to kind of force himself not to do that. Now, this staff did a good job with Miles Sanders correcting some of those warts. I think they see a lot of similarities there, and Swift could actually be a more explosive version of what Miles Sanders was for them. So we will keep an eye on that, but sometimes it's hard to coach an old dog new tricks. But at the end of the day, if you give DeAndre Swift a well-blocked run and tell him which gap to hit, and he hits that gap, you're going to get a really explosive run. And there's probably not a better offense in the league to set a running back up for that scenario. 
Um, Kenneth Gainwell just might be the best, most well-balanced running back here. He's, I would say, less proven in terms of workload than these other two guys, but I love Kenneth Gainwell, man. I thought it was ludicrous that he went in the fifth round, and it sounds like he's doing a good job to fend off both Swift and Penny for touches this year, which I love to hear. I mean, I really felt like his tape coming out of Memphis was some cross between Aaron Jones and Austin Eckler, and I still think he's got a good enough upside actually as a runner. We do think about him first as a receiving threat, but he's got good fish, uh, vision. He was efficient when they did use him. He was great in the Super Bowl, just like a guy like Austin Eckler or Aaron Jones. Even though he's only 200 pounds, he's a little bit shorter. He's got good play strength and contact balance, enough that he can be an effective runner. So I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if as the year goes on, he just kind of overtakes these guys and becomes more of a three down back in the way that Miles Sanders was for them last year. Um, but they're protecting themselves from that having to happen by bringing in these other guys. Uh, and then you got Rashad Penny, which, you know, to start his career, it was like he's always injured and not great when he plays. Now it's like when he's played, he's been a top 10 to 15 back again when he's on the field. But those injuries have just piled up and Seattle knew that he went down again last year. They let him go. The Eagles bring him in for nothing, and he's in a great spot here now where he doesn't have to see a high workload that's going to reduce his um, exposure to injury risk. And again, in a system where he's going to get a lot of clean lanes, a lot of read option handoffs where he's got a, a clear sprinting lane into a B gap, and these offensive linemen are as good as anybody at clearing the way, Rashad Penny, when he hits top speed, is one of the most terrifying speed train runners in the NFL. And he brings a downfield explosiveness as a runner that even a guy like Miles Sanders didn't have. So he's got to stay healthy, but he himself, if he does stay healthy, has a chance to overtake these other two guys as well. Doesn't sound like that's what's emerging from camp here, though. It looks like it's going to be a split. They'll probably ride the hot hand, play this by matchup, which means in terms of fantasy football, I'm not really touching this group with a 10-foot pole, especially DeAndre Swift, who... I think I want the least out of these three players and is going the highest. So maybe a late round double dip on Gainwell and Penny is nice if you can get it. But uh, anyway, you still got Boston Scott there, who's kind of just a poor man's version of everything we said about Kenneth Gainwell, someone that does have nicer play strength for a smaller back. He's been effective when they've used him. He's a nice backup for guys like Swift and Gainwell, but I don't think he sees the ball much as long as those top three are healthy. Um, but as we mentioned, you know, they build this offense around Jalen Hurts as a runner where he is built like a running back and is athletic like a running back. He's got power and contact balanced and vision and toughness, and they use that threat as a weapon itself to open up everything in this miraculous way here. So his impact gives the Eagles a 6% boost to the overall run game. That is tied for third in the NFL behind just Justin Fields and Lamar Jackson. And I really don't expect this to change next year. It's pretty self-explanatory, but it is real. And it's a big reason why many people view Jalen Hurts as a top five overall quarterback in the NFL. I think that argument is perfectly fair when you look at how it opens up this offense. And it's a reason he was an MVP candidate last year. Uh, but as if all this wasn't good enough, they've got the best offensive line in the NFL. And this is another group that's very well documented. Don't really even need to spend a ton of time on this group. They rank second in pass blocking, second in run blocking. But that is good enough for first overall because they are so balanced and good at everything here. You've got Jordan Maialata, franchise left tackle, a freak athlete out of Australia who has crazy play strength at like 360 pounds, but more athleticism than anyone should have at that size. He's basically like if Orlando Brown could move. So boom, lock it in. Left guard, Landon Dickerson, heading into year three, has gotten better every year, was a total stud coming out of Alabama. When the Eagles got him, it was one of those how did we let the Eagles get this guy kind of picks. Super smart player, a cerebral guy who played center at Alabama, but is wide and built like a guard. I think he's solidified himself as an NFL guard. I don't think they have any plans of making him their center anytime soon, but He's only gotten better, and he has the traits with the play strength and dickhead mentality 
to be something like a, let's just say, Wyatt Teller type of guard who, you know, Teller is just a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of his development. But Dickerson, I would say, is on his way to being a top seven to 10 guard in the NFL. He's arguably a top 10 already. You have the best center in the NFL, Jason Kelsey, who is still somehow like one of the most athletic centers in the NFL. I guess it's because he is undersized that helps him, but then it turns into, okay, but somehow he doesn't lack a ton of play strength, even if he plays at 290 pounds. Now he is 36 years old. Do the wheels fall off at some point? Maybe, but he had a career year last year. Obviously, his brother isn't slowing down either. Like these guys are just built differently in the Kelsey family. And with modern medicine and how some of these offensive linemen are playing into their late 30s, I'm certainly not going to sit here and project development, a uh, uh, regression rather for Jason Kelsey. So that alone would give them like a top five offensive line with just average pieces. Um, but then you also have arguably the best right tackle in the entire NFL, especially now that Tristan Wirfs is sliding over to left in Lane Johnson. Now he as well is 33 years old. He's had a bit of a career regrowth after they were a little bit worried about his longevity. So another player will have to keep an eye on, you know, do the wheels fall off, but certainly weren't any signs of that last year. This guy is a freaky athlete himself, played tight end back in his early football days, put on strength, very technically sound as a pass protector at 33 years old. Like, it's just unbelievable that they get to pair this group with what we've already talked about with this offense. Now, they do have a potential weak link in their chain here this year because they did lose Isaac Sayamalu, who himself played at a Pro Bowl level uh, last year, despite being the worst of these five, uh, which now that you look at it like this in this graphic, you can see that that's not a big deal. Um, but Cam Jurgens is going to start at right guard. And this is interesting. You know, he was a center prospect. He's viewed similar to the way we've described guys like Bradbury for the Vikings, maybe Drew Dahlman for the Falcons, these undersized athletic wide zone oriented blockers. Now the Eagles do get their center on the move a ton and you know, they really viewed him as a Jason Kelsey replacement long term, but Jason Kelsey has turned around and extended his career. So Jurgens ends up playing at right guard here this year. And it'll be interesting. You know, it's it's a lot easier to isolate a guard in pass protection than it is a center. So a lot of these undersized centers, you you look at them and say, Well, you're not terribly worried about them getting driven back by these great power rushing defensive tackles if they're under if these centers are undersized and can't handle it because you always have a guard next to them that can slide and help well now you have two undersized guys so does this not just create a problem at right guard that you didn't have in a rock in isaac sayamalu last year but does that also potentially hurt jason kelsey a little bit more as well because you don't have a rocky sayamalu to slide in and help him out there it will be something to monitor there. Cam Jurgens himself is entirely unproven. Now, I'm excited to see him. You know, when they drafted him, it made sense. He is super athletic. He moves like a linebacker. There were obvious Jason Kelsey comparisons in terms of his athleticism, but Kelsey is a different breed in terms of his play strength at his size and his overall awareness and mentality at the position. So we think Cam Jurgens will be good. We think that that he won't be a weak link, um, but he very well might be. So going to be wait and see there. I'm optimistic, but you can't really rank him too high coming into the year. And there are some legitimate questions there. Obviously, still not enough, though, to drag them out of the number one ranked offensive line. And by the way, if he is a disaster, they do have Jack Driscoll who has played a lot of guard. He's been an okay pass protector there. He's a guy that's more of a tackle in terms of build and um, really resume going back to college, but they obviously haven't needed a, him to play tackle. Lane and Maialata have been there. So if Jurgens is a disaster, you have an increased floor deeper into the season there. You also have third-round pick Tyler Steen, who I, I thought had a good chance to win the starting job. Obviously, he didn't. Um, but a, a former tackle himself that I definitely felt was better suited to play guard at the next level. 
just his build and athleticism is better suited for an NFL guard. So, uh, you know, down the road, I, I think Steen can still be the long-term answer at guard if Jurgens slides back into center. But right now they feel more comfortable, it looks like, with Jurgens at guard. Then you got Sua Opita, who's played a little bit, been okay for this team. Decent NFL level depth. Um, and then Fred Johnson, who played a bunch for the Bengals back in like 2020, was horrible, but has stuck around the league and has some experience there. Good on him for making the team. You also got to note some good skill block, skill blocking players. We talked about Dallas Goddard. A.J. Brown, when he wants to, can take you out of the run. Those guys are a nice booster to the run blocking as well. But uh, yeah, special group, a well-documented group, first in the NFL for offensive line. So you put all this together, and they come out as my third overall offense, fourth in passing game, sixth in running game. While they aren't my first or second ranked offense, probably because the lack of a truly elite quarterback, we still haven't revealed those units. It's going to be in some order, the Bengals and the Chiefs here. But I do think it's worth noting that this is the most well-balanced offense, and their ability to have an answer for everything makes this arguably the least matchup-dependent offense in the NFL, and over time, just might make them the most consistent offense, and consistency is a nice thing. It might end up giving them the best statistical output on the season. So really not a bad thing to say about this offense. You know, you're looking to say, okay, can the, is the coaching going to be quite what it was last year? Is the right guard an issue? Do injuries pop up in a way that they didn't for this team last year? It's it's pretty nitpicky uh, trying to find holes in this Eagles offense. Um, now, let's talk about the defense. I think it's less difficult to poke holes in this defense, but it's still a really nice unit. Let's start with the defensive line where, just like we did with the Jets um, deep dive, we've got to list eight starters here. They're going to have this crazy rotation. And just like I said about the Jets, Run no heddle on these guys because they they want to play these guys in specific roles that work well for them on specific downs that work well for them. And they want to rotate these guys as well and keep them fresh. So if you run no heddle on them and prevent them from rotating, so something to, you know, maybe get a little extra advantage on this Eagles defense. But really, other than that, you can't really poke a hole in this defensive line. You've got every different type of player you could possibly want. You've got your number one edge rusher in Hassan Reddick, who's done a brilliant job to continue evolving his game. You know, to start his career, he was this tweener type that was kind of a lost puppy. But now that he's been able to kind of stick at the edge and really use his work ethic to focus on his craft, he now has a well-diversified pass rushing skill set. He's got underrated power for a smaller guy. Still uses some of those linebacker instincts to be a decent enough run defender. He's not a great like edge setter against the run. He's just not a big guy, but he's good enough there. He's your, your number one. You feel great about having him there. Now let's talk about Nolan Smith, who I think they probably, just like myself, had a Hassan Reddick comp on Hassan Reddick. I don't know if any NFL front offices are putting together pro comps, but Nolan Smith is incredibly similar to Hassan Reddick in terms of being an undersized edge, but insane athletic ability. The get-off, the speed, the bend, and the work ethic is there, too. I think they'll mix Nolan Smith in. They like the juice he's going to bring and are happy to have him there, but I really think in time, they view him as a Hassan Reddick replacement. It's all there for him to become that level player. He just has to go out and prove it. So you got those two guys. Then you got Josh Sweat, who's probably the most well-rounded, uh, foolproof edge of this group, though he's not as dynamic of a pass rusher as Hassan Reddick. I, I, I think you can make an argument that Josh Sweat is the best true number two edge rusher in the league. Like If he had to be your number one, I don't know if he's quite as efficient um to to feel great about that but as your number two i don't know if there's a guy that fits that description you'd feel better about as your number two and they've got him on a sweet contract they kind of paid him before a bit of a breakout last year so he's a stud he'll defend the run as well and i don't mean to say that he's capped out as a number two he is long and really athletic he's got solid power he's got a, a solid package of rush moves he's gotten better every single year he's 26 years old that's you know it's kind of tough to project continued growth it's definitely not impossible though but he's in a really good spot where you don't 
need him to be anything more than he was for them last year. But he's going to rotate with Brandon Graham, who they kind of, at this point in his career, have brought him in as like a situational rusher. And that's helped him stay healthy. It's helped him, you know, maintain his juice and explosiveness off the ball. They'll use him in all sorts of ways. They can line him up inside as a rusher at times. But, you know, his just kind of disruptiveness and bull rush ability and ability to rip inside and get sacks, it's all still there. And he was a huge question mark going into last season was kind of an afterthought. And he ended up one of the most efficient pass rushers in all of football last year. So you think in the way that they use him, he'll be able to be again that type of impact, which was priceless for this team but he is 35 years old and has had some availability stuff throughout his years so uh, i don't want to call him a wild card because if they don't have him they've got plenty of pieces to make up for him but it was a wildly best case scenario for brandon graham uh we'll see how it goes this year but if you do lose brandon graham sticking with that edge group they still have Derek barnett now barnett very well might get traded here in the coming days he deserves to at least be a number three and definitely not a number five. I mean, he's a former first round pick. He's been a solid player. He just lacks some of that high end athletic juice to really take that next step in terms of efficiency. But he's a good all around player. You know, I'm sure teams like the Bears, maybe Carol, uh, maybe Arizona, who has Gannon, who worked with Derek Barnett. Those could be nice landing spots for Derek Barnett. Uh, but the Eagles do value that depth. And, uh, you know, he's really not going to play as long as those top four are healthy. But if something did happen to Graham or Sweat, he would give them a little bit of size that they don't necessarily have. Um, and then you got Patrick Johnson, who's just been kind of chilling, waiting on an opportunity, basically. He's a good athlete. But he did still make the team. That's a testament to him uh, in this edge group, which is a, a special one, as we just described. Now, the interior group you are hoping will be special and potentially even better than the edge group. But there is some variance with this interior defensive line. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Now, you're really optimistic that things work out here, and I'm certainly not saying things won't. But if this defense has a disappointing season, I think it's because guys like Jordan Davis and Jalen Carden, uh, Jalen Carter and Milton Williams don't continue to get better or in Jalen Carter's case, prove out to be the player that we think he can be. Um, and maybe Fletcher Cox continues to regress. You know, Fletcher Cox himself is way up there in age, 33 years old this year, and he has shown physical regression. He's not the player he once was. Now, he's still a good three-down defensive tackle, will defend the run, a pretty effective pass rusher, though the explosive trace, traits that he once had just aren't quite there. But yeah, they're they're really counting on these three. You know, you got Jordan Davis, who just didn't play much last year, did get hurt midseason, but they bring in Indomitian Sue, Linval Joseph. Davis was really good against the run, as you would expect, as that space eater. He was so good at that at Georgia. It was like, if nothing else, he's going to be Grover Stewart. And I think he showed, you know, small sample sizes that he can probably be that player, but really was not a good pass rusher at Georgia and was not a good pass rusher in his rookie season. So if he doesn't take steps up there in terms of knowing when and how to go to different moves, getting off the ball quicker, using his size and athleticism as a weapon, as a rusher, you know, I, I think there's potential for him to have the trajectory of guys maybe like Derek Brown or even Dexter Lawrence, who started as more run defenders but really came along as pass rushers. They're hoping for that growth. But that's up to Jordan Davis to take on to some of the mentorships of guys like Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham and develop some of those skill sets. But again, if nothing else, he's going to be a plodding, space-eating nose tackle uh, that has a lot of value for a team that's going to really feature four-man fronts and ask a lot of him to open things up for these linebackers. Um, so that's what you feel the best about with Jordan Davis. Um, but they also, by the way, have Jalen Carter, who uh, was gifted to them by the New Orleans Saints, who made one of the most brain-dead trades I can remember, thinking they were a Trevor Penning away from being a Super Bowl team with Andy Dalton and Jameis Winston. Um, yeah, great job, New Orleans. You just gave Jalen Carter to the Eagles. Now, outside of like work ethic and off-field potential concerns and the idea that there have been various players out of Georgia that have gone and gotten trouble in the NFL, there's no reason Jalen Carter can't be Quinn and Williams, Jeffrey Simmons, one of these top five pass rushing defensive tackles in the NFL within a couple of years 
Like, even those guys, Quinn and Jeffrey Simmons, they didn't step into the league as Javon Hargrave level pass rushers right away, right? And I do think that is why some teams were a little bit scared off of him was like, yeah, he's probably going to be a really good pass rusher right away. But is he going to put in the time to continue refining his technique and becoming a great player? That's going to be to be determined, right? He's got a really good situation here with great mentors and coaching to hopefully accomplish that. But I think a lot of Eagles fans are assuming that he's an upgrade to Javon Hargrave now, and you're fucking crazy. Javon Hargrave was awesome last year. Now, he might be a better run defender. His physical tools are insane against the run. He's instinctive against the run. That's what they really wanted him to do at Georgia was just don't be bad in run defense. Sometimes his pad level and, and like he takes snaps off sometimes because he could at Georgia when they're thrash, thrashing teams. You don't want to see that at the NFL level. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying there's off-field concerns with him. Open, clear, obvious concerns. We all want to think optimistically here, and we'll just have to wait and see if we get the optimistic outlook. And I think we probably do with Jalen Carter. But stop assuming he's going to be Javon Hargrave in year one. That would be... Let's just say very unlikely. Um, and then, oh my God, yeah, you got Milton Williams too, who'd be an interesting starter for a lot of defensive lines in the NFL. He's kind of a forgotten man here in a lot of ways. Super athletic third round prospect, was a tweener coming out of a small school, and definitely needed and still needs to improve his overall consistency and, and technique. But started to come on in the second half of last year, showed some instincts against the run. He's a guy, too, that if you lose Brandon Graham, he can do a lot of the stuff you do with Graham in terms of lining him up as a four-eye or even off the edge. He can handle it. Really fun player to have here. Year three, definitely breakout potential in his own right. So you got three guys kind of unproven slash trending up, one guy proven but trending down. Where does that all kind of meet for the interior group? We shall see. Um, the depth is rather inconsequential. You got Marlon Tui Pelotu, Moro Ojamo. They'll rotate on early down on uh, early down work. I think those guys are both solid prospects that went later than they should in the draft. I'll just say that. Good rotational options that I think could step up into those kind of Linval and Dominican Sue roles that they had last year. Uh, and then Contavious Street, I'm, I'm a little surprised he made this team. He's another guy that's kind of in that Milton Williams, Brandon Graham breath of like on pass rush downs as a four eye and a disruptor. Sure. Cannot defend the run to save his life though. So a little bit surprised they used a roster spot on him with all of these options they already have, but they must really like him. But you put all this together and you know, you get for me, the fifth best pass rush in the NFL, the 10th best D line run defense with certainly potential to be higher there, depending on what we see from Carter and Davis and that balance of being top 10 at both actually spits them out as the fourth overall defensive line. It's an obvious strength and a well-documented group. And uh, even after they lost Javon Hargrave, I still expect this to be a special group. Even if I do think it, there's a chance it's like slightly worse swapping Hargrave for Carter, basically. But then you get to the linebackers, and we don't need much of a conversation here. The Eagles don't spend a lot of time and money on this group, so why should we? Um... It is a new look group, though. They're saying goodbye to what was a really solid, cheap group last year in TJ Edwards and Kaiser White. And now they're hoping this can be a really solid, cheap group. They bring in Zach Cunningham, who I'm not going to lie, man. I freaking love Zach Cunningham. In, in last year's deep dive, I raved about him as like a quietly like underrated top 10 linebacker when the Eagles signed him and Miles Jack. I, everyone was like, oh, my God, they got Miles Jack. And I'm like, who gives a shit about Miles Jack? Zach Cunningham is way better than Miles Jack. Jack ends up leaving to go be a plumber or something <laughs> a week later, and Zach Cunningham wins the starting job. Um, if he's healthy, they have, in my mind, a top 10 or so run defending linebacker and a guy that's not a complete liability in coverage. But he has suffered a ton of injuries throughout his career, and they're playing with fire there a little bit. As we see there, their depth sucks. They got Christian Ellis is the only other linebacker currently on roster, an unproven veteran that's been around and Sean Bradley, who's kind of an athletic developmental piece who's currently on IR. So maybe he can get some of the injury luck that the Eagles had last year by coming here with Zach Cunningham, but I really don't expect him to get through every game for them. 
So that depth is a, a very major concern. And then Nicobe Dean himself is just entirely unproven. You know, a lot of people freaked out when he went in the third round, and I really didn't. I had a second to a third round grade on Nicobe Dean. I genuinely thought he was one of the most overrated prospects in that draft. That linebacker room in general just had it very easy. Now, I did think he was the best of those three linebackers at Georgia, and I like a lot of his instincts, and I think he sees the game really quickly and has a chance to develop into a really nice player, but he's undersized. He's not incredibly fast. He, I think if he had run his 40, would have been like 4.58, 4.6, which is by modern standards for the position average, especially if you're going to be undersized. I think his his he has fluid athleticism and and is good like picking up backs and tight ends uh, around the sticks and that'll help him him play well in coverage. But this idea that he's a lock star linebacker like he was healthy last year and didn't beat out Kaiser White who was just okay like I don't know I, I'm not trying to dunk on Dean I think he was a good prospect I think year two could show nice things for him. But I think a lot of people are assuming like, okay, Kaiser and TJ are gone. Who cares? N'Kobe Dean is better. And again, I'm like, that's wildly unfair to TJ Edwards and Kaiser White. And jumping to massive conclusions for a guy that benefited from a really nice surrounding situation at Georgia. So, you know, there, there were scouts that had day two grades on N'Kobe Dean that would tell you him going in the third round wasn't necessarily an injury thing. It was just that's where he should have gone all along. So I'm just saying, pump the brakes a little bit. I, I am optimistic. I think he's in a perfect situation. Like if one of your knocks was he had free rush lanes to go make plays at Georgia behind that incredible D-line, well, shit, why not just put him behind the same D-line in the NFL, right? Now, obviously, it's against NFL competition this time around, but you get the point. Like things are going to open up well for him, and he could break out in year two, but it's far from a given. He was not this perfect prospect that I think a lot of people think he was. So I don't hate their process. Like I've always said, linebacker is the running back of the defense, but you don't want it to be putrid. And if Cunningham goes down and N'Kobe Dean isn't like really good in year one, this could quite quickly become the worst linebacking room in the NFL, which last year it was a relative strength of this team. They were probably about the 12th-ish best linebacker room last year. They got a long way to go to be that. Even if theoretically the potential of a healthy Zach Cunningham and Nicobe Dean hitting his ceiling might be better. But yeah, it's a question mark and a potential weakness of this defense. Um, then you get to the secondary and really, really balanced, borderline amazing group, really. They rank second for me in the NFL. Now again, just like we said with the Jets, who were my number one secondary, um, even the Jets had questions, and, and the Eagles have some questions here. There's really not a foolproof secondary in the NFL right now, but the Eagles are pretty damn close. I mean, you've got Darius Slay and James Bradbury as, you know, last year were up there for the best cornerback duo in the NFL. I'd still take the Jets over them, but these guys were right behind them. And if they repeat that, it'll be more of the same. I, I do got to say, though, like, dude, Darius Slay... Going to turn 33 years old this year. James Bradbury, 30, year old, 30 years old himself. You know, modern sports medicine is an amazing thing, and it already did amazing things for them last year at their ages. Is there an age regression thing here? I'm not going to bet on it, but I would throw it out there as a, if things go wrong for this secondary, that's why, is that the wheels fall off in these two corners that were there they weren't cheap for them but there weren't teams like chomping at the bit to like steal them from the eagles necessarily we thought they might lose both these guys and they didn't have like major markets to go get huge contracts out there and their age is the reason why not their play because their play on the field was really the perfect duo darius slay is still incredibly quick even for his age has some long speed still to hang deep ultra instinctive zone corner they, they run so much zone here it's a good fit and and his fluid hips to kind of click and close works really well in all of the quarters coverage that they run here uh, and then james bradbury it's you know he, mentally speaking he is just ahead of the game i would say he's one of the three to five smartest corners in the nfl right now he breaks on balls he reads the quarterback's eyes he anticipates route breaks he's so good at compensating for Really, I mean, he's already just not a super athletic guy to begin with. 
And even if he's slowing down at his age, you know, he compensates for that because he is so ahead of it. So, you know, it's good that they're sticking with the scheme. If, if they were to get into more of like a bump and run man system, I would say maybe these guys' age and, and drop off and athleticism might slow them down a little bit. But, you know, with the pass rush in front of them in a similar kind of off zone Fangio style scheme, I would expect that this is going to remain a duo of superstar corners. And then you got Avante Maddox, ideal kind of prototype slot receiver, ultra quick, scrappy dude. His size and play strength will hurt him in run defense. And by the way, that is one thing on Slay and Bradbury is they just have not been good helping out against the run. It's not a big deal, but it's noteworthy. And these three together are one of the worst trios in terms of cornerback run defense for whatever that's worth. Um, but back to Maddox. You know, when you see him anticipate a route and squeeze it uh, from the slot, his speed and quickness is some of the best in the league. Now, he lacks some of that size. You want him staying in the slot. It's where he's at his best. But I, I would say he's one of the three to five best slot corners. So this cornerback trio is certainly in the conversation for the best cornerback trio in the NFL and does a lot of heavy lifting for why they rank second in DB coverage. In terms of cornerback depth, they're actually keeping seven corners on the roster. They draft Keely Ringo in the fourth round. Now, as low as I was on Keely Ringo, I had a day two grade on him. Uh, getting him in the fourth was just like you, you just should not let, just as we saw with Tariq Woolen last year and learned that lesson, or I learned that lesson. You know, I, I did not have a day two grade on Tariq Woolen, as obviously I should have, uh, but just don't let freaky corners with size and speed fall so far in the draft like yeah he's got some nitpicks he's not super sticky in man coverage he had some bad reps on tape he really did i thought first round conversation for him was absolutely mental but the physical traits for him over six feet tall over 200 pounds with legit 4-3 speed a young player players get better right and with a mentor like james bradbury who has similar size and we talked about how smart james bradbury is I'd be curious a year or two from now what kind of player Keely Ringo could be. Now, I don't think he's good immediate depth. Like I said, his tape at Georgia was surprisingly bad for a guy that got to play for the Georgia defense. And if opposing quarterbacks looked his way more often, I don't know if they were intimidated by his size and speed, but if they looked his way more often, he could have had a really bad season. So I would be worried if you had to turn to him as depth. And then it's mostly just like undrafted talent. You've got Josh Job, who had to play last year. Josh Job is going to do what he does. He's the grabbiest corner I think I've ever evaluated. You can't call him for holding every play. So, you know, it's tough to get open when you're getting held every play. And honestly, as a backup, having that kind of variance where maybe the ref just doesn't want to call a lot of holding that week. It's not the worst thing to have is like a fourth or a fifth corner to come in in a pinch because you might luck into a really quote unquote good game from him. But he is that way because his technique isn't good and he's not athletic to hang. Um, but, you know, good for him. He's he's found his way uh, to being capable NFL depth, I suppose. Uh, Mario Goodwit, uh, Goodrich played at Clemson. Eli Ricks played at Alabama, Josh Job at Alabama, Keely Ringo at Georgia. You know, they clearly have a strategy with like day three corners. They're like, just give us the guys that played pretty well in the SEC and we'll see if they can hang in the NFL. Um, I did like Eli Ricks' tape a ton. Actually, I think I had a fourth round grade on Eli Ricks, so was not surprised to see him make the team. I actually think he's got a chance to be a better corner in year one than Keely Ringo. I might even bet on that. Uh, but the difference in physical tools is just dramatic there. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm happy to see him make the team. He's super technically polished. You watched him play and you're like, he gets the position. There's just things that he can't always do because he's got like borderline four, six speed. But in an off zone system that's going to protect him over the top, Eli Ricks could carve out a very nice career in kind of a Rasul Douglas kind of way in this system. So definitely keep an eye on him if something were to happen to Slay or Bradbury to maybe be the guy that they turn to there instead of Keely Ringo, which would surprise a lot of people, but uh, the tape don't lie. Um, then you get to the safety group, and this is where you would have some questions. I think they're going to be just fine, and ultimately they were just okay last year. You know, uh, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson was a big playmaker on the back end there, but it's not like he was some elite coverage safety necessarily. Likewise with Marcus Epps, like they like him, but 
they feel like they can replace this group fairly well. Like they they just are so smart. The positions they don't invest in are the positions you should not invest in. Running back, linebacker, and safety. They are the most easy positions to shelter and the positions that really ultimately have the least impact on the overall game. So if that's the trade-off you're going to make to help make the rest of this roster so incredible, I will applaud you for that. But you do got to still talk about the group and say, yeah, I mean, they're, they're pretty mid. I mean, I like Reed Blankenship. Great undrafted pickup, super athletic dude, smart dude, never should have gone undrafted. Um, but Played well when he got out there. I think they're excited about him. We'll see what he can do as kind of a full-time starter. I know a lot of Eagles fans are excited about him. Very unproven, but, you know, I, I think he has a chance to maybe even be a better player than, like, Marcus Epps was for them. So we'll, we'll see there. Love what he showed coming downfield as a, as a run defender, too, which is really important for these quarters-heavy teams. Uh, those Both of those safeties from about 10-yard depth become... Uh, very critical in the run fits, and he did his job well there when they had to ask him to do that. Um, and then Terrell Edmonds is an interesting fit. He's been kind of a mostly strong safety, north and south type of safety in in Pittsburgh his career, and now he's being asked to be more of a fluid, quarters-heavy, hybrid safety. It'll be interesting. He's not a fluid athlete. He's not a plus coverage player. He has gotten smarter and better in coverage throughout the years. Like he's got long speed, but Pittsburgh had to really find a specific way to use him so that he wouldn't be a liability. I, I'm interested to see how this plays out. Now he will almost assuredly be a nice run defender for them. Um, I would imagine, like if you look at his PFF grades, he hasn't graded out all that well because they've asked him to play a ton in the box and his roles have been very difficult, but I would bet he has um, a really nice year in run defense. Um, just kind of playing run and chase football, which which he's he's very good at. So f fine signing, you know, good bloodlines. Brothers gotten better every year. He's gotten better every year. It's just good, good solid football player, but nothing crazy. And then they spent a third round pick on Sidney Brown. A lot of people thought he might win the starting job. Um, you know, the one thing on Sidney Brown is he's he's undersized. He's five nine, and was one of the worst tacklers for basically. If you pulled like all of the top three round prospects on the defensive side of the ball in the last five years i would bet sydney brown is one of the worst tacklers um out of that entire group you know if you just looked at his athleticism his instincts and snappiness and coverage his overall physicality and you know just his overall game is is really nice he probably would have been a late second round pick but at the end of the day, you do got to tackle if you're going to be a safety. So if they don't think he's cleaned that up yet, it makes sense why he's not starting. It's something to keep an eye on. I mean, he played a ton of slot corner. Those that have followed this channel know I love a good old slot corner converting into a quarters heavy system. I think that is the most seamless transition for a lot of these corners and safeties. He's got the fluid hips. He's got the speed to be potentially their best cover player on the back end in this system. But there's a lot to learn in quarters, too, in terms of match rules. He probably just isn't quite ready yet, but I do like the pick. Wouldn't be surprised if by end of season or next year, he's, he's maybe their best safety. But in terms of immediate impact, it might just take a minute. Um, and then they got kind of a journeyman veteran in Justin Evans. Good special teamer to have, but not much of a coverage player there, so... Yeah, you got some questions with the safety group. I don't think they're going to be like a complete open cornfield to pass against back there. Like they'll be solid enough on the back end. And obviously they have an incredible cornerback trio that they're just hoping those two vets don't regress in terms of age. So an interesting defense, right? <laughs> you know, you got some really exciting young players that are unproven. You've got a ton of like aging vets that had great years last year. It's honestly a pretty polarizing group when you really think about it. A lot of stuff went right for them last year. What if some things go wrong this year? What if injuries stack up and these vets aren't as good as they were last year? And what if on top of that, some of these young players like Jalen Carter, Nicobe Dean, Reed Blankenship, Jordan Davis, Nolan Smith, what if they aren't all that was cracked up to be? This Eagles defense might actually run into some trouble. So. It, you know, I, I believe in the group. There's a ton to work with here, a ton of talent. I think they're pretty well coached. They come out as my 10th overall defense. I know a lot of Eagles fans aren't going to like that, but, you know, this is a series where we're not trying to give any one team too much benefit of the doubt. We're ranking teams much closer to their floors than at their ceilings in this series heading into the year. And, 
yeah, it's just it's a it's a polarizing group. They come out fifth in pass defense, though. They're definitely built um, really good in that phase, but 18th in run defense with some of those questions um, with a lot of the interior D linemen and the linebackers, and uh, even some of the you know DB run supports just kind of eh. Uh, they should be a middle of the road run defense, uh, high end pass defense, similar to what they were last year. And uh, Eagles fans will just have to let me know if if you think that's too low or if I'm being fair there. Uh, but let's tie a ribbon on all of this and get on out of here before we get to our last two deep dives here this week. I do got to talk about the Eagles special teams. They actually did run into some issues last year. They graded out as one of the worst special teams in the league. Uh, you know, the punting, the field position stuff, that's really what you look at with them. Um, they don't even have a punter on their roster right now. Um, but uh, they do still have Jake Elliott, who's a good kicker. So uh, they just rank out as a, as a fine special teams, nothing crazy. We'll see if they can make some improvements in, in that regard. And then as we kind of uh, rewind on all their strengths and weaknesses, this is a team with immense strengths. And I kind of took a shortcut and just said near flawless offense, but we could list quarterback, running quarterback, offensive line, offensive scheme, playmakers, you name it. It is a near flawless offense. And as I said earlier, I think the least scheme dependent offense that can really beat you on the ground or beat you through the air. And they can beat you in the quick game. They can beat you uh, deep down the field in the passing game. Like they can really beat you however you invite them to defensively you've got that incredible pass rush with that defensive line an obvious strength for them and cornerback is a strength although also included in a potential question mark or weakness as we turn to those because the strengths in your cornerback are 30 and 33 years old do guys like slay and bradbury regress or really throughout the roster Lane Johnson, 33, uh, Jason Kelsey, 36, Fletcher Cox, 33, Brandon Graham, 35. All those guys had huge seasons for this team. All those guys were healthy for this team last year. All those guys had best case scenarios last year. Can they repeat that again in a second year? It's a legitimate question to ask. On top of that, this is a wild stat on the Eagles last year. They had a remarkable run of health, and Eagles fans won't want to hear this. Most NFL fans don't want to hear about injury luck because it's sometimes intangible and unpredictable, but here's the reality of the situation. 11% <laughs> of NFL starters get through a 17-game season fully healthy. 68% of the Eagles starters last year played in all 20 games. Let that sit in for a second. The odds of this team having the same health luck as they had last year are remarkably unlikely. So I would say that is their number one potential source of regression. And if this team doesn't win the division, I would say it's because they're probably getting more hurt than they did last year. And you start to pull a couple pieces away, how much does that hurt the other players not playing as well? Everything kind of starts to fall. Like injuries just freaking suck, man. It takes it can take the wheels off your team very quickly, even if this team has the depth to sustain it. But beyond that, you know, you got a couple um, roster questions at guard and linebacker specifically. You know, safety and running back. I don't think they're going to really be weaknesses, even if they're non-strengths. And then, yeah, you've got. A new offensive coordinator, a new defensive coordinator. How much variance and difference does that bring to the team than it did the year before? Um, there are some interesting question marks for this Eagles team. I'm obviously still a believer. I rank them third inside my top tier of NFL teams, by the way. But let's talk about their schedule. Now, I, I will say in just a few days here, I'm going to be dropping my official predictions. You know, this is more of a riding the middle of uh, what could or should happen i'm gonna you know kind of put my foot down with my actual predictions here on probably thursday with my prediction show so do make sure you're subscribed and looking forward to that um, it's always a fun one um, but looking at this eagle schedule here you know they're going to be favored in pretty much every game because they're top three team in the nfl their schedule's not particularly easy their division's really tough and they have to play the afc east which is tough so you know, do you get some schedule variants too from what was a, a more easy schedule last year? That's that's another thing you could throw into the mix there. But um, you know, we know this is a great team. They went to the Super Bowl for a reason. It's really going to come down to their own execution. It's not so much making excuses about the schedule, right? I think their over under of eleven wins 
um, does make sense um, because the schedule's a little bit harder. But as long as they can answer some of those question marks that we just talked about in our last little segment there, they should go over 11 wins. The roster talent's insane here, right? And they have a track record of going over 11 wins last year. What did they win? 14 last year in the regular season? I think in terms of Super Bowl odds at 7-1, to one, honestly, those might that might be some of the best value because the NFC is so much easier to get through. I do think this is the best team in the NFC. They were there last year. They wouldn't be more than like a four-point underdog in the Super Bowl, even if the AFC teams are theoretically a little better. Like, honestly, there might be some value there, especially if you're a believer in this team. I think the division odds are about right there at minus 165. I think the Cowboys are uh, definitely a threat, though, to this Eagles team if some of those question marks we have on this team come back the other way, right? But... That's going to do it for this Eagles deep dive. I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know your thoughts down below, what you think, too high, too low. Just write. Eagles fans, let's keep it civil in the comments down below, but definitely let me hear your agreements and disagreements. I really hope you guys enjoyed. Got two more of these coming throughout the week. We'll have that big prediction show before Thursday's kickoff. Really appreciate you guys. The series has been an absolute blast, and uh, it's it's bittersweet coming to an end here, but uh, we'll see you for the next one regardless, I hope. And peace out.